Please stand by. We're about to begin. Good day and welcome to the Beyond Housing Policy, Human Service Policies to Addressing Housing Instability. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Mr. Patrick Hyman. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. Um, I want to go ahead and welcome everyone today to the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluations uh, Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse webinar uh, entitled, again, of Beyond Housing Policy, Human Service Policies to Address Housing Instability. Uh, my name is Patrick Hyman. I am a SSRC staff member and moderator for today's webinar. <clears throat> so I think uh, before we get to our fantastic speakers, uh, I want to go ahead and spend a little time introducing the webinar topic, and then I'll move into a quick overview of the SSRC, and then I'll transition to our first speaker. So. <clears throat> Uh, today's webinar, uh, we're going to go ahead and focus on human service policies and programs that may directly influence low-income and vulnerable families' housing stability. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of folks on the call understand, uh, you know, there's a fairly well-established connection between uh, consistent, stable, and affordable housing uh, and things like positive family, physical, emotional, and economic well-being. Uh, housing instability, how, uh, which we'll kind of go ahead and define by frequent moves because of social, uh, financial, mental health, or violence-related issues, is relatively common among low-income households and other <coughs> vulnerable populations, such as you know, recently incarcerated individuals, uh, and a lack of stable housing is also linked to things like uh, increased food insecurity, mental health barriers, physical hardships, poor education outcomes for children. Um, and you know, while there's, I, I would say, little argument over housing stability and its connection to family self-sufficiency, I think it's fair to say there's less clarity on how to efficiently and effectively address this housing challenge. Excuse me. Um, you know, things like you know, the supply of affordable housing has declined, um, while overall levels of housing instability have increased. Um, you know, there's some evidence showing how uh, housing subsidies uh, for low-income individuals, while they do, you know, increase housing stability, but there's less than 25% of the 19 million eligible households that receive the support. You know, in addition, waiting lists for housing subsidies um, can be up to three years long. Uh, and so you know, given these challenges, it's important to understand the potential of um, how other human service supports and policies besides housing assistance can promote positive housing outcomes for low-income folks. Um, <clears throat> So on that point, on that topic, uh, that's what we'll be kind of looking at today. We'll be discussing how social services, specifically the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, child support, and ex-offender reentry programs can potentially reduce housing instability among low-income and vulnerable populations. <clears throat> you know, we'll examine the current impact of these programs on housing stability. Uh, you know, discuss whether expansion of these supports can reduce or further reduce housing instability, <clears throat> and uh, look into the, their effect on uh, more extreme forms of stable housing barriers, such as uh, eviction or homelessness. <clears throat> uh, but before we do that, I just want to spend a couple minutes, like I mentioned before, talking about the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse. Um, and also provide just a little bit of logistical information on uh, this webinar. So the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse is a virtual portal of research and other resources related to, of all things, uh, self-sufficiency. Um, it functions as a, uh, an online community for researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders interested in uh, topics such as self-sufficiency, employment, and family and child well-being. The SSRC's purpose 
if you will, is to, um, I think, bottom line, disseminate quality research. You know, we currently have over 6,700 items in our library, um, and we are constantly adding new resources. The library's materials are organized into 12 topical areas that are listed on the right-hand side of your screen. See the drop-down menu there. Uh, and every item included in the library is reviewed for relevancy. Um, <clears throat> Users may search by keyword or use filters like topic area, target population, uh, geographic location, um, or research methodology to browse the entire collection. And every topic area under the Browse Topics tabs includes um, recommended resource that uh, highlights research and resources recommended by the SSRC team. And each topical area also includes uh, some relevant federal laws and regulations. Under the Stay Connected tab, uh, you can find entities involved in self-sufficiency research and a list of orgs that have partnered with the SSRC to do things such as host events, um, share publications related to the field. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. You can also find uh, an events calendar that includes uh, both in-person and uh, virtual events related to the field of self-sufficiency. And I think last, um, the SSRC, it's worth mentioning, houses a number of data sets and sources to support program management and facilitate improved outcomes for children, uh, families, and communities. <clears throat> On the right side of your screen, uh, you'll find links to the library and a link to subscribe to our bi-monthly newsletter. So you select the title and then click the Browse To button for those links to open in a new window. <clears throat> okay, enough of, enough of me chatting away here. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not going to go into each of our speakers' bios in much detail, and we have a lot to cover today, and everyone should have their bios in the meeting materials already sent. So uh, really quick, uh, on today's webinar, we're going to hear from four, I mentioned, fantastic speakers. Uh, Drs. Natasha Bilkowskis from the University of Michigan and Catherine Mitchellmore from Syracuse University, who will discuss the impact of the EITC program in reducing housing instability among low-income households. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Mara Curtis from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who will present on how regular child support receipt can allow mothers to access higher quality housing and potentially avoid frequent disruptive moves. And last but not least, we'll hear from Patricia Pat uh, McKiernan from the Volunteers of America, Delaware Valley, who will discuss the barriers homeless reentry populations face in securing affordable and safe housing while also addressing what strategies may help ex-offenders overcome this barrier. OK. Oops. Oops. There we go. Oops. Back and forth. <clears throat> and uh, last but not least, uh, a little bit of logistical information before we get started. Um, I think while listening to any of our speakers today, uh, and as the slide here mentions, if you have a question, please go ahead and type it in in the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen. And we'll address all questions at the end of uh, all the presentations, so at the very, very end. Um, and if you can, we'd really appreciate when typing your question, please mention which speaker you're addressing the question to so we can direct that question to them right at the end. Uh, and then uh, I think. Lastly, a little social media plug. Um, we highly encourage folks to join today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag SSRC webinar, uh, hashtag, I should say, uh, displayed on the screen. Uh, with that, then, um, I will introduce our first speakers, uh, Drs. Pokalkis and uh, Mitchell Moore. So thanks so much.
Thanks, Patrick. So this is Natasha Polkowskis. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, Ford School of Public Policy. Um, and this is work with Kathy Mitchell-Moore, who's at Syracuse University, and we're both on this call today. And what we're going to do is I'm going to give you sort of the overview, kind of broad um, introduction to our paper, and then Kathy will dive into the results of our study. So today we're looking at the EITC, or the Earned Income Tax Credit, Housing Instability, and the Living Arrangements of Single Mothers. So although Patrick gave a little bit of an overview um, already, I wanted to give us, you know, since this whole panel is really focused on housing instability, a little bit more um, of a definition on what exactly we mean when we say housing instability. Unfortunately, there isn't one um, particular definition that everyone uses, but broadly when we're thinking about housing instability, we're really talking about some form of housing insecurity. And as Patrick mentioned, often this is, uh, this is about frequent moves, so moving more than once per year. But other studies also look at housing instability, thinking about your inability to pay rent or mortgage. At the more extreme end, it would be uh, experiencing homelessness or an eviction. Um, but also sometimes people consider other sort of quality-related measures, so things like household crowding or having broken windows, also as measures of housing instability. And then lastly, and um, also often thought about as a measure of instability, is moving in with others. Now, sometimes moving in with others is also referred to as doubling up or living in a shared household. And we're going to kind of take a broad overview and look at a number of different measures, and Kathy will describe those in more detail. But I just wanted to make one point, which is that moving in with others could be seen both as a positive or a negative, right? So in some ways, having somewhere to move is a form of social support, right? You have somewhere to go. Um, but we're thinking about this more a little bit from the other end, which is that some sort of crisis has probably precipitated the move. Um, and in general, we know that people have a preference to sort of live independently. Um, and it's also a very common precursor to homelessness. So we're kind of lumping it into this housing instability, but recognizing that it also might have a positive side. So as I already mentioned, we're going to sort of take this broad approach to uh, examining housing instability. We're also going to look at living arrangements. Um, there's been sort of a call to research to sort of think about when we're having these moves and we're moving in with others, there's a lot going on inside the household that we don't really know a lot about. And so we're also going to look at who's in the household um, when we're looking at these different households. And um, as Patrick also mentioned, right, housing costs have been increasing a lot over the last 15 years, and cost burdens, and what we mean when we say cost burden is typically the share of your income that you spend in rent. Um, and this is really closely linked with housing instability. And as we are focused on low-income families, in particular, we're going to study single mothers. Um, we're highlighting one statistic here which says that about 70% of low-income renters paid more than half of their income on rent. So this is a very important um, sort of area of research and thinking about this group in particular because they're really at risk of experiencing housing instability. And so, you know, again, as Patrick mentioned a little bit already, is why are we studying this? Well, you know, housing instability is associated with a number of bad outcomes, with poor physical and mental health, job loss, child maltreatment, poor school outcomes, as well as educational attainment. And as I already mentioned, housing instability and living arrangements are very closely tied. So, you know, why are we talking about the EITC and housing, or why did we even put this panel together? Again, Patrick uh, quoted some of the, cited some of these uh, statistics, but um, housing subsidies, while they do definitely reduce housing instability, only about a quarter of the 19 million eligible households actually receive assistance, and wait lists for housing assistance are frequently very long. And so there's been this push to sort of think beyond traditional housing policies to think about how we might be able to address housing um, issues with other kinds of policies. And that's what turned Kathy and I to looking at um, the earned income tax credit. So what we're really thinking about here is could expansions to the EITC help reduce housing instability and or address housing problems? So while I'm sure that most of you on this call know about the earned income tax credit, I just want to make sure um, we're all on the same page and kind of you know, why, why did we choose to look at the earned income tax credit? Well, it is one of our largest cash transfer programs in the U.S., um, and actually it's quite popular across the political aisle, both on the right and the left. And so when we're thinking about expansions, this is one of these policies that we might actually be able to sort of do something about. Um, it is a fully refundable tax credit that's targeted at low-income households. Um, so what that means is that taxpayers can get a refund even if they have no tax liability. And you have to have earnings to qualify, so you have to be in the labor force. Um, and unlike some of our other public assistance programs, there are no lifetime limits. 
And just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the EITC, in 2015, 26 million households received the EITC at about $66 billion a year. The maximum EITC for a family with three kids is a little over $6,000, but on average, the EITC that most people receive is a little bit over $3,000. So you get the EITC at tax time. You know, it's based on your prior calendar year's earnings. Um, it used to be available monthly, but that was discontinued in 2010 because of very low take up. And as I mentioned already, we're going to focus on single mother households, but I do want to say that the EITC is also available for single individuals and married households with kids. Um, now, the reason we're focused on single mother households is in particularly because we're really interested in sort of economically vulnerable households in particular, but also single mothers make up the majority of EITC recipients, and we were interested in thinking about the children who are in these households who might be particularly vulnerable to the negative impacts of housing instability. So this is a chart or a graph that shows you how the EITC is structured. Um, so what you see is that as your earnings increase, the amount of the EITC that you can receive increases over time, and then it reaches a plateau. And you can continue to increase your earnings where you don't reduce your EITC amount, and then eventually as your earnings increase over time, it starts to phase out but much, much more slowly. And each of the different lines represent the number of different kids. Um, the bottom line you can ignore, that's for no kids. Um, we're not going to think about them in this study. But what this shows us is that the EITC is actually it's, uh, it has not sort of earnings incentives and employment incentives built in, which is partly what makes it so politically popular. So since it was implemented in 1975, there have been a number of federal expansions to the EITC. Um, there have been increased phase-in rates, and then the benefit became larger for families that had more kids. Um, and 26 states also had EITCs, and typically they're calculated as a percent of the federal benefit, um, and they range from about 3.5% to 43%. Um, and so there's variation in both the timing in terms of when states implemented their EITCs, um, in their terms of their generosity, and some states get more generous over time, and a handful also get less generous over time. So what we're going to do in this study is we're going to exploit the variation in the timing and the implementation of these policies, both in the federal level and at the state level, to try and estimate a causal uh, effect of an increase in the EITC on housing instability. Now, why would we expect the EITC to even affect housing instability? Well, it's income, right? So we expect it to mostly be working through income, through the benefit itself. If you get a larger, you know, you get a $3,000, that's actually going to, you're going to be able to use that on housing, um, but also because of the work incentives that I described before. So if we're moving people into the labor force, then they're going to have more income, or if we are inducing them to work more hours, they're also going to have more income. Um, and then there's also some evidence that the EITC actually helps increase permanent income, which is essentially sort of average income over a number of years, in part through increased work experience, and all of these things we would expect to reduce housing instability. Um, and so we might expect that people would move out of doubled up households to sort of create their own household. They may move to a better neighborhood if they can afford a better uh, home. Um, but on the flip side, it's not totally clear that if you're sort of embedded in a low income uh, network, a lot of people are likely to be experiencing uh, housing insecurity. And if you have a little bit more security with this extra income, others may actually move into your house. And the other thing about the EITC is because it comes at tax time, um, it's a lump sum payment. And so people may use this uh, money to provide a down payment or a deposit on a, on a new house. And in fact, there's qualitative literature that suggests that people do use the EITC um, for security deposits or to pay rent in advance. Um, and there's some other related studies sort of that show that uh, emergency cash assistance program in Chicago actually reduced eviction and homelessness. Um, Mara is going to talk about her work that shows that child support payments reduce moves. And of course, there's sort of this large literature in the housing vouchers um, and public housing literature um, that I'm not going to talk about here. It's a little bit different than cash, um, but we think that the sort of the prior evidence around cash suggests that this should reduce EIT, uh, housing instability. So we have two main research questions. The first is, do expansions to the EITC reduce housing instability, and how do they affect living arrangements? And then our second question, which I, we haven't talked about yet, is actually that do families with young children respond differently than those with older children? And by young children, we mean children under the age of six. And we're looking at this um, in part, well, for a few reasons. The first is that shared living arrangements or doubling up is much more common when children are young. Um, and that is also when mothers' earnings are lower, um, in part because they're younger and haven't had been in the labor force as long. Um, but also there's evidence that actually housing instability is more common amongst younger kids. 
And we know that early childhood is a really critical developmental time period for kids, so it might be potentially more detrimental to them. Um, and Kathy and I actually have some work that also shows that um, the EITC labor effects are actually strongest when children are young. So for all these reasons, we're also going to look at heterogeneity by children's age. So now I'm going to turn this over to Kathy, who will tell us uh, about our findings. Okay, thanks, Natasha. This is Kathy. Um, so the data that we're going to use for this analysis is mostly going to come from the current population survey, uh, the March supplement, which is also known as the ASEC. So this is going to be a nice data set for this analysis because it has a, it's a very big sample and it's nationally representative. They uh, interview about 60,000 households every year. We're going to use data from the uh, survey years from, from 1990 until 2017. The other nice thing about the ASEC is that they interview households in March about their income from the prior calendar year. So this nicely lines up with the tax year. So the survey years we're going to use will uh, correspond to the tax years between 1989 and 2016. We chose these years because this will allow us to capitalize on a lot of those federal expansions that happened in the early 1990s, as well as it will allow us to capture a lot of these state implementations, uh, implementations of the EITC that have occurred over the last several decades. Uh, so as Natasha mentioned, we're going to restrict our sample to single mothers. Uh, we're additionally going to restrict it to uh, single mothers who have less than a college degree and who are between the ages of 18 and 45 years old. We think this is really the target population that's most likely to be affected by uh, changes in the EITC. This gives us about 85,000 observations. And additionally, we're going to exclude single mothers who live in public housing as we think that their housing situations are quite different than women who don't live in public housing. Okay, to supplement our data from the CPS, we're also in some analyses going to look at the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. So unlike the CPS, which is a, a repeated cross-section, they interview new families every year. The Fragile Families is a panel data set, so they uh, began interviewing mothers in 1998 who had a birth in uh, 20 large cities from 15 states, so there's about 5,000 births between 1998 and 2000. Um, so it's not going to be nationally representative. But it is going to oversample non-marital births, so we think this is, again, the target population of the EITC. Uh, so the interview years are a little bit different than the CPS. We only have data from 1998 through 2015, um, but we're going to try to make these samples as consistent as possible, so we're also going to restrict our sample to single mothers with less than a college degree. This gives us about 12,000 observations on 3,500 women. Uh, so the nice thing about the panel is that we can use fixed effects models in our analyses. Um, and additionally, the fragile families ask some uh, questions about housing that are not asked in the CPS, so we can get a little bit more richer data. Okay, so in terms of the measures that we're going to use uh, in the CPS, we can look at whether single mothers have moved in the last year. Unfortunately, the CPS does not ask how many times a mother has moved. We can only see whether or not she's moved at all. Um, but among mothers who have moved, we can uh, tell why they moved. We can get the main reason why they moved. And in particular, we can see whether or not they've been evicted or foreclosed on in the last year. Um, and then we create a measure which we're going to call a quote unquote good move or a welfare improving move. Um, and so we're, this variable is going to be an indicator variable uh, which we set to one if the mother reports that she wanted to move because she established her own household, uh, because she wanted to own her home, not rent, or because she wanted to move to a new or better apartment or home or a better neighborhood. Um, and then we're going to create a number of living arrangements measures. So as Natasha mentioned, uh, uh, one of the measures we'll create is going to be an indicator for whether uh, the single mother is living in a doubled up or a shared household, which we'll define as whether she's living with any related or unrelated adults beyond the nuclear family, so beyond the mother herself and her children. And additionally, we're going to exclude cohabiting partners from this definition of doubled up. So we don't consider cohabiting partners to be doubled up. These are quite different uh, family structures. Um, and so within the doubled up a measure, we're also going to create a separate indicator for whether the mother is living in a multi-generation household, which we define as whether there's the presence of a grandparent, a mother, and a child living in the same household. So this is going to be a subset of those who are doubled up. Uh, and then additionally, we're going to just we're also going to look at the total number of people who live in the household, as well as, as well as the number of related individuals in the household. In the fragile families, uh, we can create many of these same living arrangements variables as in the CPS, and we're additionally going to be able to look at whether they've experienced homelessness in the last year, uh, uh, in the last couple of years, 
um, whether they uh, were named on the lease or mortgage versus whether they're living in someone else's home. So in the fragile families, we're going to be um, more able to concretely determine whether a mother is living on her own in her own apartment where her name is on the lease versus whether she's living with someone else in, in their own house or apartment. Okay, so these are some summary statistics from the CPS. Uh, moving is quite common. Actually, about a quarter of our sample has moved at least once in the last year. <clears throat> uh, on the flip side, being foreclosed on or evicted is quite rare. So this is unconditional on moving. Only about 2% of single mothers report being foreclosed on or evicted. Uh, and about 10% of single mothers report that they have moved in the last year for what we think of as a good move or a welfare improving uh, move. About 15% of our sample is uh, living in a shared household, and about a third, a little bit more than a third of those are women living in a three-generation household. Um, and then in the upper right-hand corner, we give the uh, summary statistics for the number of people in the household. So in our sample, about uh, the average household size is about 3.37 people. That's including the single mother. Um, and the average family size is about 3.14 people. Okay, so I don't want to get too much into the weeds of our empirical strategy, but I'm happy to answer questions in the Q&A. Um, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to create a measure uh, of the average federal and state EITC generosity in a given year for a given family size. And so changes in this variable are going to be due to these policy expansions either at the federal or the state level. We're going to control for a number of things that are going to get us as close to causality as we possibly can get. And so we're going to interpret all the results I'm going to show you are going to be interpreted as how does a $1,000 increase in the average EITC benefit affect housing? Okay, so before we get to the, uh, uh, the housing instability measures, we first want to uh, convince ourselves that we can establish a relationship that has been long established in the literature that the EITC encourages work. And so we, we find that in our sample. Um, following a $1,000 increase in the average EITC benefit, we see that our single mothers are nine percentage points more likely to be employed. So only about two-thirds of our sample is employed, so this represents a fairly large increase in employment. Um, we also see, uh, turn to the right graph, um, that there are substantial increases in their pre-tax earnings. So not even including uh, their EITC benefits, following a $1,000 increase in the EITC, the average single mother expects to uh, see an increase in her earnings of about $2,700. So we're seeing substantial increases in employment and income beyond just the benefit itself, but also because of uh, their income. Okay, so turning to our, our outcomes for moving, uh, we see that the EITC uh, does lead to an increase in the likelihood that a mother reports having moved in the last year. So a $1,000 increase in the EATC uh, leads to about a 3.5 percentage point increase in the likelihood that she has moved. Uh, once again, we, we are unable to see how many times she's moved in the last year, so we don't necessarily take this as a negative, um, a negative result. Um, we just see that she's more likely to have moved at all. Uh, we don't, uh, on the other hand, find any evidence that uh, the EATC is increasing the likelihood that they're being foreclosed on or evicted. Uh, that middle bar, we find very little evidence of that. Uh, in terms of our indicator for whether they're moving for a welfare improving uh, reason, we do see increases in that measure. So following a $1,000 increase in the EATC, we see that mothers are about 2.2 percentage points more likely to report that they've moved for what we think of as a good reason, because they wanted to move to a better neighborhood or a better home. Okay, so turning to our living arrangements outcomes, uh, we see that uh, the, that single mothers are less likely to be doubled up as a function of the EATC. So they're about one and a half percentage points less likely to be doubled up following a $1,000 increase in the EATC. And basically all of this effect is coming from single mothers moving out of three generation households. Uh, and so this uh, d decline in the likelihood of living in a doubled up household is also correlated with declines in the number of people living in the family and slight declines in the number of people uh, living in the household. Okay, so we find very similar uh, effects in the fragile families. We find basically no uh, correlation or indication that the EATC affects eviction or homelessness. We should say that this is a, a, a very rare event, and we might be underestimating this if people who are homeless are more likely to drop out of the survey, but we don't see any correlation between EATC generosity and those more extreme forms of housing instability. Uh, and corroborating our findings from the CPS, we see that uh, Women in the fragile families are also less likely to be doubled up when the EATC becomes more generous. Um, and the nice thing we can see in the, CP, in the fragile families is that we can tell where they're moving uh, from. So in particular, that brown bar, we see that 
mothers are less likely to be living in someone else's home, so the likelihood of being doubled up in someone else's home is declining, and they're more likely to report that they're the person who's named on the lease. So what we take from this is that it looks like um, the EATC is allowing women to move out of people's, out of homes that they're residing in with other people and move into their own homes. And in the fragile families, we also see that this is, uh, uh, correlates with declines in the number of people in the household and number of people in the family. Okay, so we don't have much time here, but I do want to quickly point out that most of our effects are coming from mothers of young children. So we see that we have very large increases in the likelihood that a mother with a young child has moved in the last year, uh, which, with much smaller incre uh, increases in uh, moving for mothers of older children. This is also true with doubling up. Well, virtually all of our results uh, on doubling up are coming from these mothers with young children. And these mothers uh, are also moving to households with fewer people. We see large declines in the number of people living in the household and in the family. Uh, OK, so just to uh, uh, summarize our findings, we find that the EATC is, uh, also, uh, is uh, increasing the likelihood that a single mother moves. We find that a $1,000 expansion is associated with a 3.5 percentage point increase in the likelihood of moving. Uh, once again, we are unable to see the number of moves she's making, so this doesn't necessarily imply that she's frequently moving. Um, and we do see some evidence that they're moving for what we think of as welfare-improving reasons, and it's not because of foreclosure. Um, in terms of living arrangements, we see that the EATC is also linked with reductions in the likelihood of being doubled up and living in a three-generation household. And much of this is coming from the mothers with young children. Um, so uh, the policy implications, so while the EATC is not explicitly a housing policy, we, our results do uh, suggest that the EATC plays a significant role in the living arrangements of single mothers. Uh, what we take from this is that these large employment effects that we find appear to afford women the ability to move out of doubled up households and into their own homes. And so while we do find that they're more likely to move as a function of the EATC, we think that most of these moves seem to be for what we think of as good reasons, so because they want to own their own home, they want to move to a better neighborhood, and we do also see evidence that they're more likely to be the person named on the lease. So um, with that, uh, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you so much. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, and just a quick reminder, folks, if you do have questions, Go ahead and enter them at any point in the chat box. And again, we'll address those at the end of everyone's presentations. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mara Curtis. Um, hi. This is an exciting webinar. It's really quite interesting to be a part of thinking about things that have to do with housing stability that don't have housing in the title. So it's super fun. So this is work that's joint work with Emily Warren, who's at Johns Hopkins University in the Poverty and Inequality Research Lab there. The paper is called Child Support, Receipt, Mobility, and Housing Quality. First thing I have to say is that this work was supported by the Wisconsin Department of Children and Families and the Institute for Research on Poverty. Any views expressed are the authors and do not necessarily reflect those of the sponsoring institutions. And any errors, I'm sure, are exclusively mine. So why? The first question is why. Why would I bother to uh, estimate this question? What impels this empirical exercise? So here's the intuition. Um, as was just covered um, by Patrick and the former presenters, housing costs constitute the largest portion of most families' monthly budget, and that's particularly the case for low-income renters. The monthly regularity of an income stream, then, may matter for housing decisions as much as the total amount received annually. So the other thing that most of us who've ever moved know is that moving is very stressful and disruptive, and particularly so with children. So parents may make decisions about housing based on income that they can depend on regularly. The other part of this that becomes interesting is because state policy regulates the structure of child support payments, and so that means there may be levers if this relationship proves to be important. So what this picture is showing us, these are custodial mother of families with at least one child in Wisconsin public schools between 2006 and 2011. We're just looking at the sources of these four different types of income. We have wages in the green, child support in the blue, supplemental nutrition and assistance program in the yellow, and TANF in the green. The Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 are income quartiles. Quartile 1 is about $22,000 or less, opposed to a poverty income. Quartile 2 is between $23,000 and $55,000. Quartile 3 is between $56,000 and $75,000. And quartile 4 the $76,000. Now, keep in mind, this is the entire population of custodial mothers with a child support order. Um, so this reflects the entire income distribution who would be there. 
So the visual for me, what I really like about this slide is that it just it shows us something that we may have come to understand about our welfare state. Look at the TANF bar. TANF bar is that really tiny, tiny green bar at the top. So you see, really, it is a residual cash program at this point. Uh, the yellow, SNAP, making up a substantial portion. And then, of course, child support, particularly for the bottom two quartiles, is quite large, making up a big proportion of the earnings. Now, an important thing to say, and that we don't have on this slide, and which it would be absolutely gorgeous if we could have estimated it, would be the EITC, which would be a rather large bar, particularly for the bottom two quartiles. We're not able to reflect that because we don't have information about who's in the household, which affects the EITC payment. So here's just a little bit about child support to orient us to that part of the welfare state. So in 2011, uh, child support payments represented about 20% of annual income for all custodial parents. However, that's 66% of annual income for custodial parents below the federal poverty level. We also know that payment regularity varies. About half of custodial parents do have agreements, but about 60% of those with agreements receive full payments. Now, this was already alluded to, but just to um, be sure that we're all on the same page, um, residential mobility, thinking about moves is thinking about mobility, and not all moves are bad. Some moves could be for awesome reasons. We're a mobile population, nearly half of the U.S. population moves in a five-year period. Though the reasons for moving, as Patrick alluded to, vary by income. So lower-income households are more likely to move due to relationship dissolution or to reduce their housing costs, whereas higher-income households are more likely to have what we would term upwardly mobile moves to move to purchase a home for job opportunities. Also, as, as was covered before, it's worth repeating um, that across a number of studies using a variety of analytic techniques and data sets, research has consistently found a positive and relatively consistent association between frequent moving, and behavioral problems for children, and reduced academic performance for children. So here are two research questions that I'll show some results for today. The two questions we asked are, is the regularity of child support receipts holding the annual amount constant associated with moving more than once a year? Second question that we'll look at is whether the regularity of child support receipts holding the annual amount constant is associated with changes in the value of owner-occupied housing after a move. So the, the use of owner-occupied housing is a proxy for the quality of the neighborhood. And we can chat about that more if there are questions about why we chose that measure to reflect uh, whether we can observe whether something might be considered a quote, good or quote, bad move. So prior studies, there is very little work uh, looking at child support and housing outcomes using U.S. data. There are two studies uh, using Australian data. There's a qualitative work and there's some uh, national representative quantitative work. The qualitative study were in-depth interviews suggesting, uh, asking custodial mothers whether or not they consider the reliability of child support when they make their housing decisions. Um, and in that study, the mothers reported that they did. Using nationally representative data from wave four of the Household Income and Labor Dynamics Survey, researchers find a positive significant relationship between child support receipts above about $75 per week and a composite housing measure. Now, for us, this is useful because that suggests perhaps um, that regularity may matter beyond a threshold. And so in, with the Australian data, it seems as if a minimum of $75 per week might matter uh, and would be instructive for our context here. So to talk a little bit about what data sources we have here, uh, we have large national representative surveys, U.S. surveys, that contain questions about child support, surveys like the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, and they all ask about annual support. And this is really important and is a very vigorous child support um, literature. However, because our, we hypothesize that the regularity of monthly child support payments that these increments of money at the monthly level might be particularly important for housing outcomes. We needed to have data that would allow us to capture child support payments and all other income sources very well regularly and over time. So the data we use for this is administrative data. Um, maybe some of you out there work with administrative data. It is gorgeous in some ways. It has both strengths and weaknesses. Well, I'll tell you the strengths first. The fact that we can observe monthly child support, we can observe earnings, and program participation is the strength of this particular uh, data for this particular question. And that we can observe all custodial mother families statewide and over time, so we don't have concerns about things like attrition. However, there are weaknesses as well. We cannot directly observe cohabitation status. And so that is problematic because 
uh, it is reasonable to assume that people might move because they're changing their relationship statuses, right? So that could affect uh, the outcome that we're looking at. And also, there might be income that we can't observe in the household. Now, there are a few things we can do about that, some robustness tests that I'll mention at the end, but we can't directly observe it. We can use some proxy um, measures for such. We have limited covariates. We don't have much beyond basic demographics to uh, help us in our modeling. And also, very important to say, this is one state, the state of Wisconsin, with a unique child support regime and a unique housing market. So we would not present these results as being transferable to other states. Really, the focus is on whether or not this mechanism of regularity, which is controlled at the state level, could be instructive. So a little bit more about the data sources. Uh, the administrative data were extracted from this multi-sample person file that merges a number of administrative records housed at the Institute for Research on Poverty. Child support payments, participation in SNAP, TANF, housing subsidies, where we observe earnings from the unemployment system, and demographics, mother's age, race, and number of children. What we use and append to the data to understand whether or not post moves uh, can be considered good or bad based on the value of the housing where mothers may relocate, we use the Zillow Home uh, Value Index, which is a repeated home uh, sales measure, which we can talk about more folks are interested in. Now, who are our sample? We have uh, 13,329 custodial mothers who established a new child support order in 2002 that was enforced for at least 24 months to a maximum of 60 months. So we look at 2002 through 2006. We excluded cases that were, had orders in place for less than uh, 24 months, the child turns 18, or the mother is no longer um, the payee. So an important question is why the sample selection, why only custodial mothers? Our thinking here is that custodial mothers are still the majority of um, custodial mothers nationally in both in Wisconsin. And that although there is an increase in custodial fathers, their housing trajectories may be very different. So it seems to us sensible to focus on custodial mothers. And the reason we only go out five years is because there is research suggesting that mothers, both uh, mothers who are married and uh, non-marital births, tend to recouple within that time period. So going out further than that gave us more concern about the fact that we can't observe who else uh, may be in the household if there's repartnering. And also, going to 2006, stopped us right before the housing downturn, which seemed to be a complicating factor in trying to understand how this particular mechanism works, the regulated child support and housing alcohol. So here we are. These are some sample characteristics. Uh, these are just a few things that I would point out. If you look at the monthly order amount, the mean monthly order amount, about $368, if you see the standard deviation is large. And then you can also see something that I referred to earlier, that the monthly amount received is about $100 less. If we look at the demographic characteristics, the first age cell, mothers between 15 and 24 make up a quarter of the sample. 10% of the mothers in the first age category are younger than 20. Our sample of mothers is 62% white, 15% black, and 22% other race, with whom 37% self-identified as Hmong, Asian, or American Indian. In addition, 63% of those in the other category identify themselves as having Hispanic skin. Now, looking here, you can see that nearly two-thirds of mothers have children five years or younger, and about half of these mothers are receiving SNAP at baseline, while about 5% report receiving a housing subsidy. If we look down the chart at the monthly income, we see that that varies rather substantially across custodial mothers with a mean of about $12,000 $1,200 and a standard deviation about the same size, which really is just reflecting the diverse economic conditions of all mothers in Wisconsin who established a new order in 2002. Finally, I would also point out there's considerable variation in the housing value index across the sample, with a mean value for an owner-occupied single-family home in the bottom tier of the market at about $104,000. So for context, the minimum value in Wisconsin is $41,000 in Milwaukee, and the maximum value is found in Verona, about $179,000. If I turn your attention to rental housing costs, which we proxy here by HUD's fair market plan, it also varies rather substantially across the state. You see the mean there at 717, but the minimum value we find in Marionette County at 544, and the maximum in St. Croix County at a bit over $1,000. All of these are for a two-bedroom apartment. We can also see from this slide that nearly two-thirds of mothers reside in an urban county. 
So this table presents the proportion of mothers receiving child support across the number of months of receipt from 2002 to 2006. Across all years, between 14 and 20 percent did not receive support within 25 percent of their order amount. Between 37 to 43 percent of mothers report regularly receiving support in 10 to 12 months over the course of the year. This table explores the number of moves per year in the SNAP and non-SNAP sample. Because prior work suggests that economic disadvantage is positively associated with more moving and with moving more than once per year, if we look here across SNAP status, we can see that both groups become more stable over time, though the SNAP sample is significantly more likely to move in every year and to move multiple times per year. For example, between 14 and 22 percent of the SNAP sample reported moving once in any year, compared to 0.3 to 2.5 percent for the non-SNAP sample. Frequent moving from two to five times in a year is about twice as common for the SNAP sample at 6 percent compared to 3 percent for the non-SNAP sample. So what we did in this table, we explored the demographic characteristics that baseline by mobility status between frequent movers, families who moved more than once a year, and stable movers, those who moved once or more a year. The groups are significantly different across all characteristics, save the length of time they've had a child support order enforced. So frequent movers are, on average, less advantaged. They receive about $150 less in monthly child support, or about seven less months over the months observed. They have mean monthly incomes of about $631 compared to $1,281. 86% of the frequent movers have children five or younger compared to 62% of the stable movers. And stable moving is moving at once or more. So this table focuses on the association between the regularity of support and moving more than once a year in 2014. Results from other years are substantively similar. Results indicate that receiving child support within 25% of the order amount for 4 to 12 months is associated with a 12 to 10% reduction in the odds families will move more than once, compared to those receiving support in 1 to 3 months, all else equal. Now, if we look down there, down the table, in terms of the amount of support, mothers should receive between 5,000 and 14,999 in annual support have a 30% reduction in the odds they will move more than once a year compared to those receiving between 900 and about 2,000. So this suggests that payments equivalent to about $104 or more weekly are associated with housing stability. This is a similar magnitude to the one Australian study. Remember, they found about $75 per week having stability impacts. So results using different support categories don't change this. So I will note that the final category is really large, $5,000 to you know, $14,999, encompasses the widest range of amounts. However, the cell sizes for each category are roughly comparable, and sensitivity tests using a number of different support categories produce similar results. We tried it in many different ways. We also ran models with mothers who received less than 900 in annual support, for whom child support regularity is insignificant. That's, again, a little more evidence for there being some kind of threshold uh, effect of a minimal amount of support before the regularity of support all of equal makes a difference. Ah, this is my final table. The final table examines movers and estimates the relationships between the monthly receipt of child support and the change in the quality of housing following a move. So housing quality here is measured in units of standard deviation, approximately, approximately equal to about $10,000. These estimates are derived using pooled, pooled OLS regression with our full set of covariates and near fixed effects, uh, the covariates I showed on the prior slide. We use a standard deviation change in the Zillow index to capture both positive and negative changes in quality depending on the sign and magnitude of the coefficient. So the way to read this is all else equal, an additional month of child support would be expected to increase the housing value by about $890 for movers. So just to summarize the results, across several measures of child support and specification of moves, we find regular child support receipts is negatively associated with any moves and with more than one move a year, all else equal. And an additional month of child support within 25% of the order amount is associated with an $890 increase in housing values. However, I would really make this point, and this is a particularly important one, the way that we're measuring moves is most certainly underestimated because we're measuring moves based on zip code changes. And what we know about low-income populations is that the moves 
are generally within zip code, right? So anything we're finding here is going to be in, uh, an underestimate. So I think there are a few implications without going too far beyond uh, the associations that we find in this paper that it might be worth considering the structure of benefit programs that impact the regularity of monthly income and that they're likely to be important to consider in housing stability. Generally, the conversation around child support is about simply collecting more, which seems like there's a threshold effect and there's certainly an argument for that. However, if you hold the amount constant and you recrease the, the um, months within which a mother receives the same amount, and that has associations with housing stability, that may suggest other levers. So while increasing payments is certainly important, smaller levers, like the regularity of those payments, is associated with improved outcomes for families and could be something to consider. Thank you so much. If you're interested in the full results, the paper can be found here. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks so much, Ma. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Pat McKernan. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Pat McKernan. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Volunteers of America Delaware Valley. I'm coming uh, from southern New Jersey where we're in the middle of a nor'easter. So if you hear uh, thunderous, <laughs> if you hear thunder in the background, I apologize. I'm desperately waiting for um, my power to go out. So those of you who are also on the East Coast, I can see some of you on, uh, on the presentation. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm coming uh, at this presentation a little bit differently. I am, not, uh, I am not an academic, per se. So the presentation I'm going to be talking about today related to homelessness and prisoner reentry, I'm talking really as a practitioner. Volunteers of America is a nonprofit organization. We have uh, affiliates all over the country, and a lot of us work within this field of assisting people as they come home from prison or jail, as well as assisting with uh, homelessness and providing shelter. And I can see, uh, I can see my compatriot out in Wilkes-Barre, uh, Kristen Topowski, on this webinar as well. So for those of us, this is, uh, this is a terrific opportunity for all of us to talk about housing instability and what it means for practice. Um, I'm going to advance my slide. Unfortunately, for those of us working in reentry, these numbers that I'm talking about here are very familiar. When we talk about incarceration in the United States, uh, you'll hear things like more than 2 million people are currently incarcerated at any given time. 700,000 people leave state prison each year across the country. Uh, and, and a staggering 9 million people are released from county jails uh, across the country. Um, in New Jersey, and a lot of my, my uh, research is going to talk about New Jersey, <coughs> excuse me, um, and here in New Jersey, where we've had a lot of uh, criminal justice reform, we still have about 10,000 people leaving our state prisons a year. And prior to bail reform, we had about 15,000 people in our, our county jails across the state. Um, now that bail reform has been enacted, we have a little less than 12,000. So the numbers of people involved in the criminal justice system are really staggering. And, and I'm going to connect to Mara's point earlier about child support in a moment. Um, the home, homelessness by the numbers, however, this is what we all know, right? And, and this is uh, by HUD definition, what we talk about is having, there's nearly 600,000 people in the, in the United States that are homeless. Um, and you can see here that this intersectionality between mental health, substance abuse, uh, and chronic uh, homelessness, as well as uh, domestic violence, this intersectionality of, of issues and how it, how it impacts people's housing stability. And all of that is more complicated for people who are coming home from jail and prison. What we know is about 10, at, a, at a low end, 10% of people leaving jails or prisons come home to homelessness. And of those uh, that are coming home, uh, mental illness is double uh, for those who are coming out of the criminal justice system. It's been referenced already that only about two-thirds, uh, or excuse me, that two-thirds of people who are eligible for housing assistance uh, don't get it, right? So we only have about a third of people who are actually eligible for housing assistance that are able to receive that kind of help. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit more time here. Obviously, you know, <laughs> The lack of affordable housing uh, is, is fundamental. And so I, I think that goes without saying that there are policy implications on how to, how to develop affordable housing. Um, but in complicating these matters uh, related to mental illness, addiction, um, and prior incarceration, uh, we can see that uh, 
that th th these issues are very complicated and they're not singularly solved, right? Um, for folks who are coming out into out of incarceration, um, where homelessness may not necessarily be a predictor of recidivism, of going back to jail or to prison, it certainly complicates all of the other interventions or all of the other treatment needs that people have. Um, if I if I have a substance abuse issue or a mental health issue or I'm unemployed, being homeless or ha being uh, ha or housing insecurity absolutely complicates <clears throat> all of those other interventions. And what we know, and I think it's been mentioned here too, about doubling up or relying on other people for your housing, being released without a, a home address, being unemployed, all of these things really do serve as risk factors for people who are coming out of the criminal justice system. What we know is that housing instability begets housing instability. That's what the research is telling us. Certainly longer stays in prison uh, disrupt the contact and the support that you receive from family members. Um, for those of us who are, who I'm sure a lot of you on the on the call have read Desmond's um, book that was released last year about evicted, and, and a quote out of that I just found really compelling. When someone is incarcerated, families struggle financially, and housing instability or eviction is not uncommon for them. So people who are coming out uh, from, uh, from jail or prison are often coming home to families who are experiencing many of the things that uh, were covered in the last two presentations. Um, however, what I found really, really interesting in doing this research is the role that community programs like, like the ones that, say, our agency would run and, and how that they, uh, where we thought we were providing a real opportunity for treatment, we may be actually creating some housing instability. So, for example, um, our agency, not dissimilar from other agencies in this uh, state as well as across the country, in providing uh, halfway houses or uh, day treatment programs or um, especially any residential programs as an alternative to incarceration. Those of us providing those services certainly see them as alternatives to incarceration and an opportunity to help people get their lives back on track. Um, but many of these programs have, say, for example, a zero tolerance policy and that if someone were to test positive for drugs or alcohol, it could cost them, uh, it, it could co while they're on parole or probation, it could cost them um, their, their liberty on the street and, and require them to be part of a program, which may, unfortunately, as an a, a unintended consequence, cause them to lose their job. And anything that is impacting someone's ability to maintain employment really does contribute to this housing instability. Um, okay, trying to make sure I'm following, and following our time here. Um, Again, I put on the slide here about uh, technical parole violations, as well as in New Jersey, we've done a lot of work to reduce our state prison population. Um, and so that people within certain criteria are able to come out uh, of state prison while on pre-release to halfway house uh, to get find employment and to reunite with their families. Um, however, for some folks who per, and often have served very long periods of time, they may not meet that eligibility criteria. So in the paper, I, I kind of discussed two instances, um, or at least one I articulated in the paper, of someone who came out after 30 years of incarceration to a community that they did not recognize and to family that was no longer there. And, and frankly, had that person been eligible, had the definition been uh, expanded, that person would have had the opportunity to transition appropriately through a halfway house um, and, and come home to, uh, or with at least some preparedness, uh, rather than be released directly from prison. Um, so that, that those kind of policy implications about how do we, how do we review um, eligibility criteria for programs that help manage the transition home. Um, one of the other thing, and, and for those of us who work in, uh, in prisons, jails, or, or in the reentry field, this term called maxing out, right? So maxing out fundamentally means that I've served my time that I need to be serving in, in a state institution, and I re am released to the community without uh, having to be on parole or any other type of community supervision. So you max out, you are really released and have no other obligation to a parole entity. Um, that it presents its own challenges, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, for Mac, and, and what we see here in our state is that max outs have exploded. People uh, where uh, 10 years ago, you know, uh, more than half of the folks were released 
from state prison, we're, le we're leaving on parole. And 10 years later, what we were finding is that only 28% of people were being released to parole, and more than half are now being are maxing out. And why is that significant, right? Well, what we know, what the research has been telling us is that parolees have, people who are on parole have better public safety outcomes. They're less likely to be rearrested, they're less likely to be reconvicted, and they're less likely to be reincarcerated. Parole, it absolutely serves as a protective factor. Um, and so that this trend is really concerning to us, and I think it absolutely has policy implications um, within our state and beyond. Um, <laughs> and how this also complicates uh, all of the other players who are at the table to assist people who um, are homeless or, or uh, find themselves homeless in the community. Um, it, and I could probably speak for an hour on how a lot of systems are designed to ration care to people um, because we don't have enough services to go around. But how this applies directly here. It's not uncommon in our state, and probably not in, in the states that you reside in as well, for people to come to a Board of Social Services to apply for emergency assistance, and um, in that application process, somehow be determined that they've caused their own homelessness. Um, and that is, uh, again, another topic that we probably could go on for an hour. However, however, as it applies to people coming out of prison, it is not uncommon that people who present themselves at Board of Social Services as a person who's been released on parole and say that, they've been, that they're currently homeless, I've actually had people, uh, their response be, well, you've caused your own homelessness by accepting parole without an address. So these, these clearly have, uh, we have some education to do with our, our partners uh, within uh, emergency services, but compound that with understanding that people who are on parole have these safety outcomes, it absolutely has, um, it, it, it needs attention, right? Um, so I'm going to skip out over our max out. What we also know uh, with working with people with, from uh, coming out of the criminal justice system is that there are a host of collateral sanctions uh, when you are involved in the criminal justice system. And they act, all of these complicate housing insecurity. Uh, there are pub, there are bans from some permanent and some short-term bans from public housing. Often people are ineligible for TANF or GA benefits. If you have a, if you're convicted of a sexual offense, there's community notification, which limits the uh, your ability to apply for housing. Uh, um, and if you are a juvenile and you uh, this is often what I get calls for is if you are a juvenile and your victim was a family member, then you're often not able to go home. Uh, being involved in the criminal justice system, often we see the loss of driver's licenses, which has um, implications for employment, uh, as well as crushing financial debt. Um, the legal financial obligations, this is a growing area of attention uh, that really, really impacts people who are low income. Um, I've, I've been talking about this as sort of the criminalization of poverty. And someone else who I know is on this webinar, uh, Renee from the Anti-Poverty Network, has, and where I've talked about the criminalization of poverty, has made it very clear that we're about criminalizing the poor and that people coming out with fees and fines and court costs that uh, simply absolutely um, complicate their ability to uh, make ends meet um, that, and uh, this vicious cycle of debt really absolutely contribute to housing insecurity. And, um, and as I was thinking, Mara, as this relates to child support, often people are leaving jail or prison with child support uh, orders and having this other t crushing legal financial debt, um, it, it absolutely implicates uh, or, or it impedes their ability to make regular child support payments. Um, having warrants, uh, often these are very connected to your legal financial obligations that you may not be able to make. Uh, having warrants affects your credit history, may let, uh, look a less attractive to, uh, to landlords as well as if you have lost your um, parental rights while you've been incarcerated, um, that it, it might limit your eligibility for, uh, say, TANF and things like that, or for, for the receipt of child support. Um, again, I won't go on about the rationing of services. So what we do know is that uh, there are obviously protective factors for housing stability as it relates to people who are coming out of prison and jail earnings being the obvious one, and we've talked about some of those earlier, 
but people, if they have, uh, if they're coming out of prison and jail and have the opportunity uh, to as early as possible find employment and begin earning and saving, that um, contributes to, uh, to housing stability. Having social support, like family or other romantic partners that um, are able to help them get back on their feet once they come out. Um, parole support. In New Jersey, uh, and, and perhaps New Jersey is an anomaly in this regard, and uh, does assist people who are homeless in providing transitional housing uh, uh, homeless uh, parole clients. Um, but I think I've already connected that less and less people are being paroled, and more and more people are leaving state prisons without parole support. Um, but we do know that parole has resources as, uh, as well as treatment programs that can help people get back on their feet with employment. Um, and help uh, shelter them. Uh, discharge planning pre-release is a, is a uh, absolute factor that contributes to housing stability prior to incarceration, helping people identify uh, where they're going to be living as well as planning for uh, employment. Um, those things uh, are a, a big value. And then the case management piece, um, helping people navigate after and before they are released from prison or jail, um, and as well as once they are housed. Uh, helps with, uh, with their ability to move on to permanent housing. So I want to spend a little bit more time talking about evidence-based practices and, um, and uh, some of these things have been just folks who have been uh, coming out of the criminal justice system, but the value of permanent supportive housing um, is, has, uh, is, is some of you who sort of work in this field is not unsurprising, right? So rapid rehousing and housing first models, um, what we know is that they have been successful in moving people from homelessness to housing. Uh, one of the models that I, I talked about in the paper was the FUSE model from the Corporation for Supportive Housing and how successful it was reducing the use of jail and emergency room, uh, jail days and emergency room use for folks who were uh, chronically homeless and had mental illness. Uh, providing supportive, uh, providing supportive uh, permanent housing was absolutely correlated with lower uh, psychiatric hospitalizations, fewer jail days, dramatic decline in shelter days, and increased housing stability. Um, so, uh, some of the housing, uh, the other uh, evidence-based practice that I wanted to mention was a housing first model out of Washington, out of Seattle. For those of you who are unfamiliar with housing first, it's a model of assistance. To, uh, to the homeless that prioritizes permanent housing, uh, offers voluntary supportive services, and doesn't require sobriety for individuals with addiction and values, client choice in the service for, for, uh, provision. So it's not required to be uh, sober or in recovery prior to the provision of, of a housing program. Um, and what they saw in uh, the Seattle model was the, the Housing First model was correlated with a more than 50% reduction in jail bookings and jail days. Um, uh, I will say as a practitioner, there are complications with, uh, with providing housing first models. Uh, often I see clients having difficulty paying rent, uh, but that case management, is, as we talked earlier, was, is a, a contributing factor to their success. Um, uh, one of the other models I wanted to talk about was the Washington State Reentry Housing Pilot Program that was uh, very successful and had about 208 ex-offenders that were provided with affordable safe housing and supportive services in three different counties. And what they found, the, the uh, reentry housing program was uh, significantly uh, reducing new convictions and readmissions to prison for new crimes. Um, uh, and one of the, I think, interesting correlations that I found in that study was that um, Lutz, the research, researcher, found that living in a house or an apartment didn't matter as much as having roommates. And roommates that, um, that participants are assigned to live with, uh, uh, the people who had roommates were um, more successful in, in, in the program, which is going to, I want to, I know I only have two minutes left, um, that really the last thing I wanted to spend some time with was talking about shared living arrangements. Out of Colorado, uh, the Division of Criminal Justice Office of Domestic Violence and Sex Offender Management had uh, a research on shared living arrangements and found that high-risk sex offenders living in shared living arrangements had significantly fewer violations than those in other living arrangements. Um, and the study compared uh, people who live in uh, shared living arrangements alone with family or friends in homeless shelters and jails and work release programs, and it was uh, 
uh, an absolute way of promoting housing stability while promoting public safety. Uh, SLAs in Colorado were found to have the shortest amount of time between sex offender uh, committed when they committed a violation and when the probation officer or treatment provider found out about the violation. Um, and it, it was for me that that is a significant public safety issue, sort of counterintuitive when we think about those of us who work within the three entry population that to house offenders together and somehow that they um, they are, uh, are going to be less likely to recidivate. But that is what the research was saying. And it definitely has implications for us as we approach promoting housing stability amongst this population. Roommates are an absolute protective factor. So as far as um, housing implications for, uh, for folks who are coming out of prison and jail, the review of collateral sanctions and how that applies to housing instability, housing instability uh, invest in strategies that support vulnerable people and target strategies uh, that promote public safety. And obviously, I think all of us are talking about the need for affordable housing. Thank you. Patrick, I want to turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Pat. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Just a, a quick reminder, uh, go ahead and type in your questions into the chat box. And we will direct those to the speakers. We've had a, a couple of questions come in. Um, and I, I know speakers, some of the speakers mentioned wanting to ask questions of fellow presenters too. So we'll see if we can make time for that. Uh, and just because we're seeing this question a lot, um, yes, the, the slides and the webinar recording will be posted on the SSRC website. So uh, real quick, and that, this question is for Pat. Um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to paraphrase here. Uh, I think it's regarding social networks. Um, <clears throat> and that, uh, Pat, you mentioned roommates and family as being potential protective factors. Were there um, so called, uh, other social assets, sex offenders, that you encounter in your work that appear to help increase housing stability? Okay, thank you. Um, well, the, what the research was really pointing to was the shared living arrangements and roommates. From my own personal experience, um, it, depending on the need of the person, uh, the more chronic uh, the mental health and substance use issues, uh, the case management provided to those folks in permanent housing is critical. Um, but also, while people are in housing, connecting them to their own social networks, right? So having them connected to treatment or to employment or to school, um, having them invest in, you know, or us identify those sort of social capital um, relationships and whether that's Bible study or uh, however they define that, but having them invested in their own community so that they, um, you know, when we're asking people to replace behaviors, what are we replacing it with from socially? So I, I would, we have had a lot of support from the faith community who um, have, in, uh, in, I have actually one partner who provides housing, who is a ministry of service to people coming out of prison. So those social networks um, obviously support mentors as well as um, addiction recovery supports as well. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is for Natasha and Kathy. Um, and again, I'll try to paraphrase here. Is there a next phase of your research? Is there a, um, I guess an EITC and housing stability question, or I suppose an EITC and other self-sufficiency question that uh, you're now looking to explore or feel like the, the field could potentially explore? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, well, Kathy, jump in if I'm <laughs> yeah. answering this incorrectly. Um, you know, with relationship to this, you know, topic in particular, I think, um, you know, we've actually explored a number of different data sets to try and get at more detail around understanding housing further. Um, but the problem is it's very hard to do well. Um, and so we, we've um, had some difficulties, shall we say, trying to look at in other sources. Um, so, you know, on the sort of housing side, no, but we are interested in sort of dr drilling in and thinking more about the living arrangements um, component because I do think I'm someone who studies living arrangements and I know that the living arrangements um, 
you know, are really associated with child well-being. And so Kathy and I are thinking about trying to do some more, I think, on that front. Kathy? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's right. I think, yeah, we're trying to um, find other ways of figuring out who these women are living with and who's moving in and out of the household. Like Natasha mentioned, it's really hard to find good data on this where we can actually have, you know, good uh, representation of EATC exposure and also some, you know, more concrete measures of housing quality. Um, so we're we're open to suggestions if everybody, anybody has some data sets lingering around they they have to offer up. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with what everything Natasha said. And just to follow up on that, another EITC focused question: uh, Does the EITC help women who have not worked during a period of a year? Uh, I think the the ask of the question felt it was relevant just given the current job market. That's yeah, I think that's a really good question. Oh, sorry. Um, so I think this is something that's been emerging a lot with the more recent EITC literature is that these federal expansions that happened in the 90s really led to large increases in employment. And I think part of that was because of the favorable job market. And there is more of this question of is this actually helping people in times where there's more uncertainty in the labor market. Um, and that's the big drawback of the EATC is if people don't have any earnings during the year, they can't claim it. So, um, uh, and that could be partly why we're not seeing any reductions in homelessness or eviction, the more extreme housing instability outcomes because the EITC can't help people at the very bottom of the income distribution, people who are not working. Thank you. Uh, and just <clears throat> keeping the theme of the ITC going, uh, do you have any projections on the longevity of the positive moves for families that have utilized the ITC to move? Oh, that's a great question. I wish we yeah. had data on that. <laughs> Again, it's a data issue, right? I mean, there we, if we had longitudinal data, so we tried to look at some other longitudinal data sets to try and get at some of these housing issues. and. What we would be able to do there is see if someone moved and then see if they were um, you know, sort of staying in these better living arrangements. But those data sets, um, in it, for a variety of reasons, because of things like they're in a later time period and didn't capture all of the federal expansions, we weren't really able to see that. So I wish we could, but uh, we don't know. Understood. I know we've got a few questions coming in, folks are typing. Uh, but if, if speakers, if you had a question you wanted to ask another presenter, now would be a great time. If not, we'll give folks a few minutes to type in their questions. Okay, let's give let's give folks um, again. It looks like multiple people are typing in questions right now, so. We'll just have a momentary, slightly awkward pause while folks type in their questions. Okay, uh, and this question is for, um, I guess, any one of our speakers. Uh, can any of the speakers comment from their research about the impact of unstable housing circumstances on self-sufficiency, um, a precipitating cause of the need for public aid, for instance. And I think folks have touched on that a little bit. But I don't know if uh, one of the speakers wants to dive into that a little more. I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. I think this is uh, David Wright. You're saying that can. Uh, the, in, the impact of unstable housing circumstances on self-sufficiency, a precipitating cause for the need for public aid. I'm not sure I understand the question clearly. Um, you know, clearly there is a need for the affordable housing and for vouchers, for housing, uh, housing choice vouchers. Um, uh, you know, the employment is, is, and we've already talked about the need for um, steady, steady income. Uh, for people to maintain uh, maintain permanent housing, um, for us, the, 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 I don't know that the participating class are public aid. I'm not sure I understand the question as clearly. Perhaps the other um, researchers do. And, and maybe maybe David is asking um, for data information on instances where unstable housing leads folks 
to maybe who weren't previously engaged in public assistance leads folks to um, become enrolled in things like WIC, TANF, SNAP, EITC, which again, I think yeah, I think folks have been touching on during their presentations. But um, I think uh, there were still so, go ahead, sorry. So this is Mara. So there there certainly are you know associations and correlations, but the, from the research point of view, this is a hard one, right? So there are the same things that might lead one to being insecure in your housing might also lead one to having problems in labor markets. So good studies that try to contend with that, it's a hard, it's a hard question. So we know that these things are associated, but we don't, we don't always know the direction in which they are going. Even though they're intuitive, to actually test that is somewhat of a difficult um, proposition. Thanks, Mark. Um, a couple of questions, Pat, these are directed towards you. Um, I'll yeah. start with the first one. Uh, I'm not sure you can see them, but I'll go ahead and read them in here for the yeah, rest no, of the I audience. See it, um, yeah, the low income housing development plan for Camden uh, or southern New Jersey. I know, yeah, there are always affordable housing um, <laughs> developments, and that often ha affordable housing development opportunities have um, uh, set aside for low income. Um, I, I don't know of any, you know, large scale low income housing developments that are planned, especially for Camden. Camden has been very resistant. Uh, Camden uh, has been uh, very, very committed to wanting market rate housing, uh, which is, is it really, it's been a, a challenge to do that. Um, so I, I, I feel you, Michael. <laughs> uh, we are doing our best to develop affordable housing, um, but I don't know that any are targeted necessarily for Camden right now. I could be wrong. I know that Volunteers of America, we're not developing, we're, we, we're, we are developing some affordable housing in Burlington County area. Um, and then the next one, uh, Mary has asked about uh, data on homelessness uh, and other barriers for females leaving prison. Um, you know, I, I think, Mary, if you're working with women coming home from uh, prison, uh, that certainly the needs of women are very different than the needs of the men. Often the women that, and I, I wrote a little bit about the paper, I didn't spend any time in the presentation talking about it. Um, the, the women often have a lot longer histories involved in and out of the criminal justice system, complicated by substance abuse and mental health issues. There, you, you know if you're working in this field that women coming in and out of jail and prison have higher rates of homelessness, excuse me, higher rates of mental illness and substance abuse fueled a lot by sexual trauma. Um, so there are, um, there are some programs. I, I run one <laughs> here in Camden, New Jersey. Um, and I, I, can, um, I, I don't have the data in front of me. Uh, right now, but I know that there are programs across the country. A lot of times um, now that because so much attention is being paid on the opiate epidemic, there are a lot more programs designed for women who have opiate addiction. And we're starting one here in southern New Jersey with women who are pregnant and uh, homeless and uh, have an opiate addiction. Um, but they are, the women often have higher rates of mental illness. And so you can just see that all how that would complicate their housing instability. And I'm looking at the next question, which I assume, because I've mentioned Matthew Desmond, Florence Stanwyck mm. is asking this question, right, that point out evictions can lead to people losing their jobs because they have to go to court. Absolutely. Um, it, and it's, in, you know, it's interesting. Desmond talks about evictions causing poverty, right? I, I would suggest that involvement in the criminal justice system causes poverty as well. This crushing legal debt, interruption in, in, in employment ability, um, uh, I, I agree, Laura. That that is uh, that has been my experience. Um, involved, you know, not only addictions causing people to lose their job, but certainly complicated by all of the, the resulting um, um, legal financial obligations. That, by the way, impact their ability to pay child support and other obligations that they have. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Mary, you're talking about incomplete female versus. Um, Mary asked a question about whether uh, the, the results for uh, programs for women versus men. Um, yeah, I, you know, Mary, I only, for my area of expertise, I've only been looking at our completion rates for my own programs that I run for men and women specifically. Um, so I would have to, I'd have to go look. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure offhand to, to answer that question related to uh, results for, for female programs versus male programs. 
Thanks, Pat. Um, and Cindy, I, I see you asked a question uh, earlier during the presentations about statistics or case examples that were more California or West Coast specific. Um, not sure if our speakers have an answer to that, just given the New Jersey focus, and then our other speakers having more of a looking at national surveys. But I can connect with you afterwards. The SSRC has a lot of um, California specific resources that deal with housing instability, so I'm happy to connect you to those. And are, are there any other questions? We'll give folks just a, a quick chance to give in a final question. Um, <clears throat> And if not, um, I want to give a really big virtual round of applause to our speakers. Um, thank you so much for your info today, uh, all your insights and research. Um, and thank you to everyone for taking time. Oh, sorry. I think all folks are typing in a few questions. I think folks are just thanking everyone. Yes. Um, so again, thank you to our speakers again, uh, to our audience for taking time to uh, listen today. And with that, we will adjourn the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.